in the twinkling of a night It had happened The great silver bridge It did sway From the cars and the trucks Lined upon it Lord, I wonder if they had The time to pray You are driving across the Silver Bridge on a cold December evening in 1967 near Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It's rush hour and the bridge is packed with commuters heading home from work on a Friday. You are but one of many people crossing this architectural marble that connects West Virginia and Ohio over the Ohio River, attempting to get home in time for dinner and holiday preparations. Worn Christmas decorations are strung across the main street of the small town, and there is a bustling, vibrant energy as people prepare for the Christmas season. The traffic is slowed due to the number of commuters, and your mind wanders as you slowly creep ahead, listening to local news broadcasts regarding protests of the war in Vietnam, the death of Otis Redding, or the final voyage of the Queen Mary. Suddenly, you hear a loud snapping and cracking noise that shakes the bridge. It starts to sway and bounce violently. You can hear people screaming and honking their car horns, and you know something is terribly wrong. Within seconds, the bridge starts to collapse, and cars, trucks, and buses plunge into the icy waters below. The sound is deafening, and you feel your car tilting and sliding toward the edge. You try to keep calm and get out of your vehicle, but it's difficult with the chaos and panic around you. As you make your way to the edge of the bridge, you see the extent of the disaster. The entire middle section has collapsed, and there are dozens of vehicles and people in the water. You feel helpless and terrified as you watch people struggling to escape from their vehicles, some of which are already sinking. The rescue efforts are chaotic and intense. Emergency vehicles and boats arrive on the scene, and you can see lights reflecting off the water. It's clear that many people have perished in the disaster and the few survivors are traumatized and shaken. In this episode of The Haunted Chair, we will continue our investigation into the bizarre and strange occurrences often associated with UFO phenomena, inclusive of purported sightings of the Mothman prior to the Silver Bridge disaster, and its apparent sightings in Chicago, Chernobyl, and across the globe. We will probe the witnessing of doppelgangers and men in black, and engage in further speculation as to what may be the origin and nature of the manifestations, as well as their intended purpose, if any. As observed by John Keel, the questions begin to move past the simplistic, can these things be, into the real question, why do these things exist? Greetings, friends. It's been far too long. I know the weather is ghastly and the roads are treacherous, but I'm so glad you could join us this evening. Have a drink. Warm yourself by the fire. Let's discuss real and genuine tales of terror, the strange and bizarre, 
Myths and legends, haunted histories and ghost sightings, cursed objects, cryptids and UFO abductions, secret societies, the occult, and dark conspiracy. Let's discuss all of these things, but first, please have a seat in the haunted chair. In Brooklyn, New York from 1877 to 1880, a possible precursor to the Mothman was said to be haunting the skies. This winged figure was reported to be performing aerial acrobatics over the sunbathers at Coney Island. The sightings were first reported in a letter to the New York Sun by a Mr. W. H. Smith on September 18, 1877. According to witnesses, the creature was not a bird but a winged human form with a cruel and determined expression. The flying man became a local sensation and was reportedly seen by many reputable persons as he flew at an altitude of about 1,000 feet using bat's wings and swimming-like movements to maneuver. Despite the sightings, the incidents remain unexplained as there was no evidence of advertising signs being towed or primitive gliders being used during that time period. The idea of human flight had been studied by Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century, but attempts to build a man-powered ornithopter were unsuccessful. Since then, thousands of inventors have worked on the idea, constructing canvas wings moved by the muscles of optimistic pilots. Even with the advent of jetpacks and drones currently, the technology is still not capable of creating such a sustained and powerful display, at least according to conventional wisdom. For centuries, the concept of using wing-like motion for propulsion, known as an ornithopter, has been known but has never been successfully achieved by humans. However, sightings of flying machines with flapping wings have been reported during UFO waves, but these reports are often overlooked by enthusiasts who only focus on disc or cigar-shaped objects. Winged beings have been a part of folklore across cultures since ancient times. Sculptors in the times of Babylonia and the pharaohs added wings to lions and unidentifiable creatures. Although biblical angels were never described as having wings, painters and sculptors have always depicted them with feathered appendages. There is nothing so powerful as truth, and often nothing so strange. Daniel Webster Approximately a year before the Silver Bridge tragedy, the residents of Point Pleasant were plagued by the sightings of something sinister and seemingly beyond belief. In November 1966, two grave diggers, Kenneth Duncan and his father-in-law, Raymond Wamsley, were working in a cemetery near Plendenon, West Virginia, when they saw something that they couldn't explain. They described it as a brown human being with wings that rose up from the trees and flew over their heads. They were both terrified and ran back to their homes. The next evening, they returned to the cemetery with two other men, Paul Yoder and Lee Eddy, in hopes of seeing the strange creature again. To their surprise, they did see it, and this time they got a better look. 
They described it as a large gray creature with wings folded against its back. It had glowing red eyes that shone like bicycle reflectors, and it emitted a high-pitched buzzing sound. The men were all frightened by the creature and quickly left the cemetery. They didn't report the incident to the police, but word of their sighting soon spread, and other people began reporting similar sightings of a strange creature with glowing eyes and wings. Just a few days later, in Point Pleasant on November 15, 1966, two young couples, Roger and Linda Scarberry, and Steve and Mary Millette, reported to the police that they had encountered a large, white creature with glowing red eyes. The sighting took place near the TNT area, which was once a World War II munitions plant. During World War II, the land was used as an ammunition manufacturing facility employing several thousand people at its peak. To ensure safety, explosives were stored in strategically scattered bunkers, also known as igloos, covered with a thick layer of earth. After the war, the area was abandoned and repurposed as a wildlife management area and landfill. However, in the 1980s, it was discovered that the land was heavily contaminated by explosives and byproducts. Consequently, it was added to a federal list of hazardous waste sites eligible for cleanup. In May of 2010, one of the igloo bunkers containing 20,000 pounds of unstable materials suddenly exploded. Fortunately, no one was injured. The place is still desolate and now on private property, although to capitalize on the current commercial viability of the Mothman, you can schedule a hayride that takes you through part of the Erie Wasteland. The igloos still stand out starkly, and the old factory buildings are broken shells. The silence is only broken by the wind rattling through the high steel catwalks, and the occasional pigeon fluttering in the rafters. Or is it a pigeon? Linda Scarberry described the creature as a tall, slender, muscular man with white wings. She also claimed that she was unable to see its face due to the hypnotic effect of its eyes. The witnesses were so disturbed that they quickly drove away, and the creature pursued them, emitting a screeching noise, until they reached the Point Pleasant city limits. Initially, journalists were doubtful about the claims of the Mothman, they referred to it as a mysterious creature and a bird in their reports. Nevertheless, they did publish Mallet's statement describing it as a man with wing. As time passed, the number of sightings of the Mothman in the Point Pleasant region increased and the legend started to form. Within three days of the initial claims, eight more sightings were documented by the Gettysburg Times including two volunteer firefighters who claimed to have seen a very large bird with large red eyes. According to the Mothman legend, Newell Partridge, a Salem, West Virginia resident, reported that he observed bizarre patterns appearing on his television screen one morning, followed by an eerie noise coming from outside his house. Upon shining a flashlight in the direction of the sound, Partridge claimed to have seen two red eyes that looked like bicycle reflectors staring back at him. This story is still well known in Mothman folklore as it supposedly led to the disappearance of Partridge's dog. Some people still believe that the creature was responsible for taking his beloved pet. Could there have been a less fanciful explanation? The idea that a winged creature was lurking in the town was refuted by Dr. Robert L. Smith, an associate professor of wildlife biology at West Virginia University. He suggested that the sightings could be explained by the presence of sandhill cranes, which are nearly as tall as humans and have vivid red skin surrounding their eyes. Some people speculated that this crane was deformed, especially if it had resided in the TNT area. Still others suggest that the creation of the Mothman was the work of a prankster who went so far as to hide 
in the munitions plant. These claims are at least somewhat refuted by the fact that many, if not most, West Virginians are outdoor people and quite familiar with the native flora and fauna, enough to be able to tell the difference between a six-foot-tall winged man and a deformed crane. Additionally, the researcher John Keel carried a picture of a sandhill crane in his briefcase, showing it to resident witnesses, and not a single one of them recognized it or believed it resembled what he or she had seen. Could there be an explanation specifically in the region of Point Pleasant that has contributed to these supernatural occurrences, ill omens, and instances of tragedy? The region surrounding the Ohio River, particularly Point Pleasant, West Virginia, is known for its haunting stories and strange occurrences. The area was considered haunted even by Native Americans, who spoke of ghost lights, phantoms, and unusual creatures. Some theories suggest that this area is a window between dimensions, allowing paranormal activity to come and go at will. Historians have traced the roots of these supernatural tales back to the American Revolution, and a powerful curse that was cast by Chief Cornstalk, a feared and respected chieftain of the Shawnee tribe. In the 1770s, as American frontiersmen migrated westward, a powerful confederacy of seven Indian nations, the Shawnee, Delaware, Wyandot, Mingo, Miami, Ottawa, and Illinois formed to defend their territory. The Shawnee tribe, led by the revered chieftain Ke Tugua, or Cornstalk, was the most dominant. As the white settlers moved into the Kanawha and Ohio River valleys, the Indian Confederacy prepared to protect their lands by amassing approximately 1,200 warriors in a rough line across the point from the Ohio River to the Kanawha River. They planned to attack the white settlers near an area called Point Pleasant on the Virginian side of the Ohio River. However, when the colonial military leaders learned of the impending attack, they sent troops to confront the Indians. Despite the relatively even numbers of fighters on both sides, the Native Americans were outmatched by the muskets of the white soldiers. The battle resulted in the deaths of roughly 140 colonials and more than twice as many Indians. The tribes retreated westward into what is now Ohio, and to prevent them from returning, a fort was built at the junction of the Kanawha and Ohio rivers. As time went on, the Shawnee chieftain Cornstalk sought peace with the white settlers. In 1777, he pledged to inform his new allies when the British tried to incite the tribes to attack the colonies. However, the tribes once again began amassing along the Ohio River with the intention of attacking the fort. Not wanting to engage in war with the Americans, Cornstalk and Delaware chief Red Hawk went to the fort on November 7th in an attempt to negotiate peace before fighting broke out. Cornstalk informed Captain Arbuckle, the garrison commander, that while he was against war with the colonists, his tribe was the only one holding back from joining the British. He feared being compelled to side with the Confederacy. After confessing to Arbuckle that he might allow his warriors to fight if the other tribes did, Cornstalk, Red Hawk, and another Indian were taken hostage by the Americans. They hoped to use Cornstalk to dissuade the other tribes from attacking. But the Native Americans were caught in a stalemate, as none of them wanted to endanger their leader. Cornstalk was a figure that inspired both fear and admiration among the white settlers on the frontier and the other Indian tribes, thanks to his exceptional skill in oratory, fighting, and military strategy. Legend had it that the Americans were able to win several battles against the British, despite being outnumbered and outgunned, 
thanks to Cornstalk's tactics. Despite being taken as hostages, Cornstalk and the other Indians were treated kindly and provided with comfortable living conditions, which caused some to speculate if the chief's captivity was voluntary at the outset. Cornstalk even aided his captors in drawing maps of the Ohio River Valley during his confinement. However, on November 9th, when Cornstalk's son, Elena Pisco, arrived at the fort to visit his father, he too was detained. On the next day, shots were heard from outside the fort's walls in the direction of the Kanawa River. When soldiers went to investigate, they found out that two men who had left the stockade to hunt deer were attacked by Indians. One of the men managed to escape, but the other was killed. When the garrison received news of the soldiers' death, they were outraged, and despite orders to the contrary, they stormed the quarters where Cornstalk and the other Indians were being held. Even though they had no connection to the crime, the soldiers decided to exact revenge by executing the prisoners. When they burst into the room, Cornstalk stood up to face them, displaying such courage that it momentarily gave the soldiers pause. Nevertheless, they fired their muskets at him, shooting him eight times before he collapsed to the floor. Red Hawk attempted to flee up the chimney, but he was dragged back down and killed, while Elena Pisco was shot while sitting on a stool. The other unnamed Indian was strangled to death. As he lay dying in the smoky room, Cornstalk reportedly uttered his now famous curse. According to legend, he gazed upon his assassins and addressed them, saying, I was a friend to the border man. Many times I have protected him and his people from harm. I did not make war on you, but only to defend our homes and lands. I refused to ally with your white enemies against the British. I came to this fort as your friend, and you killed me. You killed my young son by my side. Therefore, may the Great Spirit's curse fall upon this land. May nature itself bring destruction upon it. May it be blighted in its aspirations, and may the power of its people be weakened by the stain of our blood. According to legend, Cornstalk spoke those words and then died as he lay there in the smoke-filled room. The other Indians' bodies were disposed of by being thrown into the Kanawa River, but Cornstalk was buried near the fort at Point Pleasant, where he overlooked the intersection of the Kanawa and Ohio Rivers. He remained there for many years, but in 1794, the town of Point Pleasant was founded near the old fort site. The Indian's grave was undisturbed for many years until 1840, when his bones were removed and reburied at the Mason County Courthouse grounds. In 1899, a monument was erected in Cornstalk's memory. In the late 1950s, a new courthouse was built in Point Pleasant and his remains, which now consisted of three teeth and about 15 pieces of bone, were reinterred in an aluminum box at the corner of the town's 2 Indy Wee Park, next to the grave of a Virginia frontiersman whom Cornstalk once fought, but later befriended. In his honor, a 12-foot monument was erected. In Point Pleasant, there are two monuments dedicated to the historic period. The first one, 86 feet tall, was scheduled for dedication on July 22, 1909, but was delayed after lightning struck and damaged the crane used to put the monument in place. The monument was finally erected a month later, but another lightning strike on July 4th, 1921, damaged the capstone and some granite blocks. Despite these strange occurrences, the monument still stands today, commemorating the fallen soldiers of the Battle of Point Pleasant in 1774. Some believe that the lightning strikes were a result of Cornstalk's curse, and strange happenings, river tragedies, and fires occurred in the area for 200 years. Skeptics dismissed these claims as mere superstition, but the death toll and eerie coincidences suggest otherwise. 
Numerous disasters and tragedies have been attributed to the curse, including the Monoga coal mine disaster in 1907 that claimed the lives of 310 miners. In 1944, a tornado swept through the tri-state area, killing 150 people. The Silver Bridge collapse in 1967 resulted in the deaths of 46 individuals and was linked to eerie sightings of the Mothman and other paranormal happenings. Other incidents include the Piedmont Airlines plane crash in 1968, a Southern Airways DC-10 crash in 1970, and the explosion at the Mason County Jail in Point Pleasant in 1976 that claimed the lives of Harriet Sisk, her husband, and three law enforcement officers. In addition, a freight train derailment in 1978 contaminated the town's water supply, and the Willow Island power plant collapse that same year killed 51 men. Point Pleasant has also experienced floods, fires, and other strange events. While some argue that these are simply tragic coincidences, others see them as evidence of Chief Cornstalk reaching out from beyond the grave. Could the Mothman simply be one of the various manifestations of this blighted area? Strange shapes light up the night. I've never seen them, though I hope I might. Don't ask if they are real. The men in black, their lips are sealed. Blue Oyster Cult, take me away. The Athens Messenger on Sunday, January 22nd, 1967, in a column titled, Where the Waters Mingle, by Mary Heyer, included the following. It seems that West Virginia is seeing its share of strange objects. The latest was by Tad Jones of Dunbar, who said he came upon the unidentified flying object on Interstate 64. Its description is like many which have been reported in many areas of the United States and around the world. The article continues. The origins and motivations of these creatures, if they are real, can only be speculated but millions of people throughout the world are now convinced that something is going on and that there is somebody out there. More and more respected scientists are beginning to take the matter seriously as they delve into the question of life on other worlds. Mary Heyer, who passed away at the age of 55 on February 15, 1970, was a well-respected newspaper reporter for the Athens Messenger and also managed the office located on 6th Street in downtown Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Throughout the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant, Mary Heyer frequently reported on the peculiar happenings in her newspaper column titled, Where the Waters Mingle. As a result of her interest in the subject, she and author John Keel became associated together. Mary actively aided Keel with his investigations by keeping him informed via correspondence. She claimed to have witnessed the strange lights in the sky on multiple occasions and even professed to have been visited by mysterious men in black. Mary's persistence in reporting the strange phenomenon in Point Pleasant caused some to believe that the men in black made regular visits to her office to discourage her from releasing newspaper reports. According to Miss Heyer, on a bitterly cold Friday, December 22nd in 1967, as the townspeople of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, were still fighting the weight of their grief from the Silver Bridge. Two men entered her office, both short and wearing black overcoats. Their dark and somewhat oriental complexions made them almost seem like twins. They asked her about flying saucer activity in the area, but Miss Heyer was taken aback. She had been focused solely on the bridge disaster and hadn't given much thought to such reports. Nonetheless, she showed them a folder filled with clippings of sighting reports. One of the men glanced through it briefly, asking if anyone had told her not to publish the reports. Miss Heyer shook her head and put the folder away. If someone ordered you to stop writing about flying saucers, what would you do? She was asked. I would tell them to go to hell, she replied with a faint smile. 
The two men exchanged a quick glance before leaving. Mary returned to her task of revising her lists, and when she looked up again, the men had vanished. Yet another visitation occurred later that afternoon, when another stranger walked into her office. He was of slight build, about five feet seven inches tall, with piercing black eyes and unruly black hair that looked like it had been recently cut. His complexion was even darker than previous visitors, suggesting he may have been of Korean or Oriental descent. She found his unusually long, tapering fingers to be intriguing. He wore a cheap-looking, ill-fitting black suit that was slightly out of fashion and an oddly knotted tie. Strangely, he wasn't wearing an overcoat despite the fierce cold outside. He claimed to be Jack Brown, a UFO researcher, someone who is initially familiar with the research of John Keel and a personal friend of Gray Barker. Gray Barker of Clarksburg was West Virginia's most renowned UFO investigator. He had published several books on the subject and frequently visited Point Pleasant. Brown had asked the same question. What would you do if someone told you to stop publishing UFO stories? After receiving essentially the same response, he launched into a tirade as to how he believed Keel was a liar and wanted to be taken to where Mary and Keel had reported they had seen things. Mary refused and the visitor left, never to be seen again. But she could never get over his awkward manner and appearance, almost as if something was attempting to take on the vestiges of humanity without being able to fully integrate them. The MIB, or Men in Black, are enigmatic individuals who are said to use intimidation to silence witnesses and reporters of unusual events, such as the Mothman sightings. According to reports, these individuals often have dark features and an Eastern European appearance, with expressionless faces and unusual eyes that may be concealed by dark sunglasses. Their movements have been described as inhuman. Typically traveling in small groups, usually consisting of two or three, the men in black seem to possess an uncanny ability to know intimate details about the people they approach, often using this knowledge to unnerve and intimidate them. There have been accounts of their ability to perform astonishing feats of illusion, appearing and vanishing without leaving a trace. Witnesses have even claimed that these individuals carry advanced technology and one woman alleges that her memories were erased by them. Reports suggest that some men in black would dress in military or Air Force attire, but with minor discrepancies like incorrect placements of insignia, wrong shoes, or driving cars unsuitable for military personnel. In May 1967, Miss Ralph Butler from Owatonna, Minnesota, encountered an officer named Richard French, who matched the description of a man in black. He was approximately five foot nine inches tall, with an olive complexion, long dark hair, and a pointed face. His clothes seemed new and clean, and even the soles of his shoes were unscuffed. When offered jello, he appeared unfamiliar with the dessert and attempted to drink it. Witnesses also described strange eating habits, such as not knowing how to use utensils and not chewing their food. The men in black's odd behavior led many to suspect that they were not human, but impersonating officials and authority figures. The phantom photographers were known for taking pictures of witnesses or investigators using a camera with a blindingly bright flash that could disorient the person while the stranger made a quick getaway. In one instance in October 1967, a man in Ohio returned home to find an intruder dressed in black in his living room. The intruder took the man's picture with a bright flash, disorienting him and allowing the stranger to quickly escape. 
nothing was stolen from the apartment. These photographers were also known to take pictures of houses where the owners had witnessed something strange. They would arrive in black Cadillacs, set up a tripod and camera, take a picture of the house and quickly drive away without contacting the owners. Some of these photographers even posed as professionals and offered to take pictures of new parents and their babies. They would take the photos, give the parents a business card with a neighboring town listed, and then vanish, never returning to sell them the photographs. Another strange phenomenon that could be categorized as part of the Men in Black encounters is that of the phantom meter readers. This involves a man dressed in coveralls knocking on the door of a suburban house, claiming to have come to read the electric or gas meter. Once inside, he would disappear into the basement and not reappear for hours. In some cases, the man would vanish without a trace, even though there was no way out of the basement. Other times, he would emerge from the basement just as the homeowners went to check on him. Additionally, there were reports of strange, tanned men driving black limousines who posed as census takers. Albert Bender, a UFO researcher, stated that in 1953, he had encountered three enigmatic men dressed in black clothing. He claimed that this experience had frightened him to such an extent that he no longer wished to pursue UFO research. Following this, others reported similar encounters, and instances of such stories were discovered throughout history. Individuals wearing entirely black suits, white shirts, black ties, and black shoes were frequently seen in the small town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia during 1966 and 1967. Witnesses described their outfits as being immaculate yet outdated. These mysterious figures reportedly interrogated locals about the Mothman and warned them not to discuss it. In addition to interrogating reporter Mary Heyer about the Mothman, the men in black reportedly intimidated witnesses of the creature, including Connie Carpenter. Dottie Campbell, a friend of Heyer, gave interviews about the men in black and recounted that she and Heyer were extremely scared of them. According to Campbell, Heyer had told her that these mysterious men never seemed to blink their eyes. Mothman witness Linda Scarberry was quoted in an interview. The men in black wore black suits, black hats, and sunglasses. They drove black cars, Cadillacs, I think. They looked like human beings, but their skin was somewhat transparent. You could see the veins in their hands very clearly. Their fingers were longer than normal person's fingers as well. Daddy shook hands with them, and he said that they were awkward in shaking hands. They seemed to not know what to do or how to shake hands. She continued, One of the cars would follow us around. There were three men in a car. The men in black went so far as to follow us through the drive through of a restaurant. We were afraid to turn around and just looked in the mirror at them. Steve and Mary Millette, who had witnessed the Mothman also, were visited by a man and a woman who wanted to take their picture. The couple noted down the license plate of the Volkswagen, but when they reported it to the police, they were informed that the number did not exist. John Keel attempted to confront the men in black and even had local police in several towns on the lookout for them. While in West Virginia and Ohio, he would receive calls from people claiming to have seen the men in black at his hotel. Keel would then race over to the location, but they always managed to elude him before he arrived. According to Keel, the men in black were known to drive black Cadillacs until he wrote about it causing them to switch to Volkswagens. The license plates on the cars were often unissued. In the spring of 1967, while walking along 42nd and 3rd Avenue in New York with a female friend, a man with a pointed face deliberately took their photo and then fled. 
The man was poorly dressed in a sports jacket and slacks. In 1975, John Keel dedicated his book, The Mothman Prophecies, to Mary Heyer and the people of West Virginia. After the 2002 movie with Richard Gere, there was a Mothman popularity resurgence in Point Pleasant, and the small town has become a tourist attraction with its Mothman statue. There is a Mothman Museum, an annual Mothman Festival, and the beast has grown into a pop culture phenomenon with hundreds of illustrations, sculptures, paintings, plush dolls, and games. There is a Mothman IPA by Greenbrier Brewing, and you can even find people participating in Mothman cosplay in an online game called Fallout 76. But then something strange occurred. Beginning in 2011, there were sightings reported in the American Midwest of a peculiar winged being that bore a resemblance to the West Virginia Mothman. Was this creature now taking up residence in Chicago? Or was someone perpetuating a series of hoaxes? Three reported sightings occurred in 2011, followed by many in 2017. All these were within the city limits of Chicago. On October 13, 2011, the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, received a report with a photograph that had a blur of something bat-like in it, soaring near a statue of a Native American standing on top of a former tobacco shop. Then, in September, there was the report of students at the University of Illinois Chicago. Sam Maranto, the Illinois State Director for MUFON, stated, one of them looked in the mirror and saw something that was looking at her from her fifth story window. She turned around to see a pair of red eyes. There was this creature just sitting perched outside her window looking at her. She said she felt like prey. One of the woman's boyfriends had a similar experience while walking through a nearby park and saw a large creature with eyes that had the intensity of two glowing embers sitting on top of a basketball hoop. It flew away when it saw them. In 2011, another sighting was reported to UFO Clearinghouse regarding an occurrence in Washington Park, located near the University of Chicago. According to a witness who was among a group of people, they observed what they initially referred to as a flying man, which later transformed into an enormously large flying possum that possessed glowing red eyes. These are just some of the many sightings reported in Chicago in recent years. Could the Mothman have changed residence to the Windy City, or are these just cases of witnessing cranes, bats, or other similar natural creatures? On April 26, 1986, the explosion of Reactor 4 at Chernobyl resulted in one of the worst nuclear accidents in history, affecting millions of people across Europe. However, prior to the disaster, reports surfaced of a large black bird seen in the area, leading some to believe it was a premonition or even responsible for the tragedy. While its identity remains unverified, witnesses describe the creature as otherworldly even demonic. But was there really a blackbird present in the days leading up to the disaster? And if so, was it trying to convey a warning? According to the legend, an evil and unholy entity was allegedly seen in the skies over Chernobyl in the days leading up to the April 26, 1986 disaster by the workers inside the facility. Reports of sightings continued during the subsequent cleanup efforts after the disaster. Prior to 1986, there were no incidents reported in the Chernobyl reactors, which were constructed between 1972 and 1983. However, rumors began to surface about a dark entity near the power plant at the start of that year. These reports were mostly ignored until a female employee had a personal encounter with the cryptid one night. While in the parking lot after her shift, the worker saw a massive bird with glowing ruby red eyes 
lurking in the bushes. When she tried to alert others, the creature screeched and took flight, causing her to run back to the facility. Following this, many of the personnel began having nightmares about a tall, dark bird with glowing eyes. However, as there was no concrete evidence to support their claims, they were quickly dismissed. As the disaster approached, rumors of the supposed sightings increased rapidly. People claimed to see the creature in the forest, hovering over the power plant, and even in the nearby town of Pripyat. These rumors were so widespread that some workers were afraid to come to work, citing their old superstitious beliefs. However, the workers who stayed were threatened by individuals claiming to be from the KGB, who demanded that they return to their workstations. After the Chernobyl disaster, the number of sightings decreased significantly. Nevertheless, members of the cleanup crew continued to report encounters with the beast. Strangely, those who claimed to have seen the creature after the disaster subsequently died from acute radiation poisoning, leading to speculation that the creature appeared only to those who were already marked for death. There is no definitive proof of the creature's existence due to the fact that those who saw it died soon after. Nonetheless, the black bird was only the first of many reported cryptids in the years that followed after the creation of the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone. Only a select few were permitted to enter. Some of these individuals reported seeing strange creatures moving through the woods, adding to the lore of the region. Andrei Karsukov, a nuclear physicist from the University of Buffalo, shared a chilling experience he had at Chernobyl in 1997. Arsukov arrived at the power station early in the morning to check for radiation leaks. He went straight to Reactor 4's sarcophagus, where he began taking radiation readings. Suddenly, he heard someone screaming for help and shouting that there was a fire inside. Andre rushed upstairs to call for security or find an official, but was told that he was the first person to open the door to the reactor control room in three years. This meant there was no possible way that someone else was in the room, at least not alive. If an intruder had managed to sneak in, the alarm would have been triggered and they would have been escorted out immediately. Despite the door's multiple security measures and lack of access for years, Andre heard someone screaming for help and shouting about a fire inside. Later that evening, while the team was eating dinner near the plant, the floodlights suddenly switched on. The switches could only be physically manipulated, but the whole team was present. While they initially suspected a power surge, the power quickly came back on. It was almost as if someone or something was listening to their conversation and responding to it. Andre believes that something ominous resides in Chernobyl. If one is to assert that these phenomena are real, what could be the definitive purpose of both alien visitations as well as by those of the men in black? The possibilities are almost too numerous to catalog. Some believe that there are many types of alien races that are visiting Earth for the purpose of benign intervention and to save us from the possibility of nuclear devastation or environmental collapse. Some believe that their intentions are not so benign, and that the numerous accounts of abductions and cattle mutilations are but a precursor to a large-scale invasion. Still others assert that they are already here, interwoven into the fabric of all major world governments, and those entities have been working in tandem with them in exchange for advanced technology and knowledge. Yet another assertion, put forth by many in the New Age community, is that they are either benign or malevolent spiritual manifestations, working on the level of angels and demons, for our betterment or for our ruin. With so many possible explanations, who is to say what their ultimate purpose or goal might be? 
However, in his book, The Mothman Prophecies, John Keel made an interesting observation. He stated that on a tree-lined street in Greenwich Village, New York, there is an old house that is said to be haunted by a strange ghost. The house has been included in catalogs of haunted places by renowned ghost chasers such as Hans Holzer, and according to reports, the phantom was seen by multiple people dressed in a long black cape and a wide-brimmed slouch hat that covers its eyes as it moves from room to room. Various speculation was created about this apparition, such as that it may have been the remnants of a spy from the Revolutionary War who was caught and killed in the house. But there were never any reports of hauntings in the house until after it was vacated by a prolific author named Walter Gibson, who is known for his famous character from the 1930s, The Shadow, an enigmatic character who often lurked in dark alleys, dressed in a cape and broad-brimmed slouch hat. Keel speculated that this apparition might be a residue from Walter Gibson's powerful mind. He further posed that the observations of individuals who can perceive radiations and objects invisible to the rest of us may form the basis of a significant part of the UFO lore. Perhaps people who see ghosts or apparitions, like the wandering shadow, possess these abilities and can perceive forms that are always present around us, like radio waves. The Tibetans believed that advanced human minds can manipulate these invisible energies into visible forms called tulpas or thought projections. Could Walter Gibson's intense concentration on his shadow novels have inadvertently brought a tulpa into existence? Occult literature offers countless examples of ghosts, hauntings, and specific sites for years or even centuries, carrying out the same mindless activities repeatedly. If a house is built on such a site, the ghost will leave doors ajar as it moves through to carry out its programmed activity. Additionally, UFO activity is concentrated in the same areas year after year, with a particular penchant for the ancient Indian mounds in the Ohio Valley. Could some UFOs be tulpas, created by a long-forgotten people, doomed to senseless maneuvers in the night skies forever? During Keel's investigations, he interacted with many UFO witnesses whose lives spiraled out of control, people who suffered nervous breakdowns and were hospitalized, or even ended in suicide. Some of the people who encountered the Mothman died within six months. And then, 13 months to the day, November 15, 1966, to December 15, 1967, the strange occurrences ended with the deaths on the Silver Bridge and the associated grief at the loss of 47 individuals, almost as if a prophecy had been fulfilled. One possibility, at least as plausible as the others, is that these manifestations were the result of a collective psychic force that somehow anticipated the tragedy at the Silver Bridge and manifested materially perhaps with the assistance of an outside intelligence, or perhaps on its own, into the strange occurrences. If true, these manifestations might share the same purpose as such reported entities as the Hat Man to feed off of negative energy. Keel declined to make a definitive conclusion. However, he did assert that at the end, his investigations led to more questions than answers. He stated, after spending a lifetime in Egyptian tombs, among the crumbling temples of India and the Lama series of the Himalayas, endless nights in cemeteries, gravel pits and hilltops everywhere, I have seen much and my childish sense of wonder remains unshaken. But Charles Fort's question always haunts me. If there is a universal mind, must it be sane?
Well, it seems that the rain has abated for now, and the road should be safe to travel. If you must go, please promise to visit us again soon. Stay in touch with us for frequent updates, more real tales of the supernatural and horrifying, and the chance for you, dear listener, to possibly own a piece of paranormal history. Till we meet again, we will save you a seat in the haunted chairs.